Okay, we're going to be talking about Texas and the Alamo. Let's just keep in mind that Texas has been known for a great number of things, and we aren't going to explore Texas's more recent history. Conversely, we are going to be taking a trip back to Texas's roots and its annexation in the United States. So grab a seat and maybe some fresh popcorn. You're gonna be here a while. From the beginning, Texas was a much desired region, mainly being that its climate was suitable for growing cotton. The southern farmers and plantation owners thrived on cotton, it being one of their most valued cash crops, and thus favored the annexation of Texas to America. In reply to these pleas, a man by the name of Moses Austin worked to make this dream a reality. Being a banker and businessman, Moses acquired a large tract of land to begin the process. In 1821, however, Moses Austin died and left the remainder of his work for his son, Stephen Austin, to take over. Shortly following Mexico's independence from Spain, Stephen arrived in the soon-to-be Texas. Mexican officials granted Stephen with permission to create his colony, but there was a catch. Of those who volunteered, Stephen had to select the most ethically righteous and hardworking, who would become Mexican citizens and take part in joining the Catholic Church. As expected, Stephen agreed to Mexico's terms and attracted over 297 settled families by 1827. These settlers would soon be called the Old 300. Soon hearing of the success, Stephen had attracted many more settlers to join the new colony of Texas. By 1830, there were approximately 29,000 settlers occupying the region. Naturally, there were 25,000 American settlers as compared to the 4,000 Tejanos, or Texans of Mexican descent. It would not be long, however, before the two groups engage in conflict. The American settlers had many complaints as to the Tejanos. Such complaints were sent to the Mexican government as cries of change. The Americans were used to governing themselves, and they did not appreciate Mexican officials spitting orders at them. In addition, they resented the fact that official documents were written in Spanish, and most would not bother to learn to speak and or write it. Not to mention, Mexico outlawed slavery in 1829, outraging many southern farmers and plantation owners. On the other hand, the Tejanos despised the fact that many American settlers had migrated to Texas illegally. Furthermore, the new immigrants showed little to no respect for Mexican culture and society, did not follow through with their promise to become Mexican citizens and take part in joining the Catholic Church. What did the Mexican government do? Why, they disclosed American immigration to Texas, sending troops to further enforce the immigration laws. How did the American settlers in Texas feel about these actions? Well, one group, named the Hotheads, guided by a young lawyer named William Travis, began ranting on and on, begging for a revolution. Another group, named the Coolheads, guided by Stephen Austin, politely requested that the Mexican government reopen Texas to American immigration. In addition to this, he wanted to make Texas a separate state, so that they could run their own affairs. Traveling to Mexico in 1833, Austin, Texas presented these requests to General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, the head of the Texas government. Santa Ana, and not to be confused with Santa Claus. Well, what a nightmare that would be. No offense to Malin. Anyway, Santa Ana, however, happily threw him in a prison rather than making a bargain with him. Texas then rose up in revolt, soon following Austin's release. Santa Ana marched north with approximately 6,000 Mexican troops in the hope of defeating the newly created rebellious forces. Texans had taken control of an old mission formerly known as the Alamo, in a little town in San Antonio. In February 1836, Santa Ana's many troops reached and surrounded the town, being defended by approximately 180 Texan volunteers, including William Travis, David Bowie, and even Davy Crockett, a famous frontiersman and former congressman, they had little chance of victory. General Santa Ana raised a horrific black flag, an icon meaning expect no mercy, and no, not the film with Billy Blanks. William Travis, in response, fired a cannon. The Texans were helpless as Santa Ana's troops drew closer to the Alamo, and despite being outnumbered at least 10 to 1, only one Texan fled the scene. 
Messengers were sent to other towns, searching for reinforcements who had not abandoned the island. Devastated from the disaccompaniment of outside help, William Travis screamed, Victory or death. The Mexicans spent the first 12 days firing cannonballs at the small town until March 6, when Santa Ana gave the orders to send his troops inside. You could hear nothing but rifle fire taking over the mission. The battle was over within the first 90 minutes, with every last defender of the Alamo dead, and those who survived, executed. Santa Ana thought nothing of the Alamo, but unknowingly raised much fury with the Texans following the executions of those who protected it. Representing the Texan people was Sam Houston, the commander of the Texas Revolutionary Army. As waiting Texas was losing hope, their only strategy was to retreat eastward, and this would then be harder for the Mexican government to supply the army and keep it battle ready. The plan was not popular, but hey, it worked. Catching up with Houston's troops at the San Jacinto River, Santa Ana had a plan. He believed that his troops would attack at dawn and thus keep his own troops awake at all night. They were surprised to find that no forces made their way into Santa Ana's camp and rested for the moment being. Staging a surprise attack that afternoon, Houston's troops made their way to the inside of the camp where Santa Ana was sleeping. They overcame the Mexican camp, shouting, Remember the Alamo, the whole time. Despite fleeing the scene, Santa Ana was captured and taken into custody. He ordered his remaining troops out of Texas to gain his freedom. Mexico had lost Texas, but the Texans who owned it, and who had finally won their independence. Shortly following Texas's independence, it became its own country called the Lone Star Republic, named after the single Lone Star on its flag. Most of the Americans who occupied Texas wished to annex it to the United States. Texas, however, remained an independent country for approximately 10 years due to America's indecisiveness. Southerners wanted to add another slave state, while Northerners thought otherwise. Many others speculated that such actions could lead to war with Mexico. A huge part of the 1844 presidential campaign was influenced by the question, should the United States expand its territory? As one of the candidates, Henry Clay, warns Congress, annexation and war with Mexico are identical. Another candidate, James K. Polk, being a strong believer in Manifest Destiny, successfully got Congress to annex Texas following his election as the 11th president. In 1845, Texas was declared the newly annexed 28th United States. 